Well, it's time for our prophecy update. We dedicate a portion of our service every Sunday morning to Bible prophecy because of the events that are taking place in the Middle East. Typically, we'll take some newsworthy headlines and look at their importance and their significance as it relates to what the Scriptures say it will be like in the last days. However, today we're going to do something, again, a little bit different. Uh, my uh, heart has been directed by the Lord to look at the profound significance of the seven feasts that were given to Israel that are found in the book of Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me how it is that many of us don't realize how important the Old Testament is to us as the New Testament church. What if I were to tell you that the first four of these feasts were fulfilled at Jesus' first coming? Now, what, what if I told you that the last three of these seven feasts are yet to be fulfilled when Jesus comes for his bride in the event we call the rapture and subsequently the second coming. Everything is going perfectly according to God's prophetic program and plan. Now, God gave these feasts to the Israelites to celebrate, to commemorate they were to be a time of celebration, which is really what feasts mean, as we'll see in a moment. But I would really encourage you to, when the opportunity presents itself, to make a personal study of Leviticus 23, for in it you will find the seven feasts in their detail. We're going to kind of go through them quickly, both today and next Sunday, Lord willing. Uh, it says in verse 1 of Leviticus 23, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. These were holidays, holy days. They were celebration days that have profound prophetic significance. The word feast translated in the original language of the Old Testament Hebrew is the word moad. This just so happens to be the same word in my native tongue of Arabic. Uh, moad in Hebrew and Arabic means appointment or an appointed time that points to a time. So if I were to say to you, I have an appointment with you, in Arabic I would say, Ana andi moad ma'ak. I have an appointment with you. This is what Jesus is saying to them then and to us now. I have an appointment with you. I want to have you celebrate this feast which will point me to you and point you to me, because that's what it was to do. These feasts, these celebrations, were a fixed time or a season, specifically a festival that pointed to the way a sign would point to a destination, namely the person of Jesus Christ and his destination at his first coming. Uh, the seven feasts were given to Israel to celebrate over a seven-month period of time, beginning in spring and continuing through the fall. And you'll find this in Exodus 12, 23, verses 14 through 17. Of course, Leviticus 23, Numbers 28 and 29, and Deuteronomy 16. Now, for most Christians, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, especially Numbers, and Deuteronomy seem to be archaic. They seem to be nebulous in their importance to us as Christians. And I would beg to differ, and I know those of you who are a part of our Thursday night Bible study in the Old Testament, starting with the book of Genesis, which we completed and now are in the book of Exodus, would beg to differ as well. These Old Testament books, especially the first five books of Moses, 
are packed full of profound significance for us as the church, as it was to them then as Israel. Well, Colossians, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter recorded in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. He said, Let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere, now watch this, shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. These festivals were shadows. Now, we don't worship these these festivals, these feasts, because that's just the shadow. But in order to have a shadow, you need to have substance to create the shadow. So like when I come home at the end of the day and Sabia runs to me, <laughs> which she does, and I am so toast, <laughs> you know, with her arms, you know, Baba, Baba, you know, I pick her up. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's so adorable. But... um I digress. Anyway, but when I walk up to the house, she doesn't run up to my shadow. She runs up to me. The shadow just points to me. The shadow says there must be a me in order for there to be a shadow. And that's what these festivals were. The substance, Paul says to the Colossian church, was Jesus Christ. So all these feasts were shadows that pointed to the person that actually made the shadows and points us to. Uh, one commentary says it this way, this passage refers to the feasts as a mere shadow of things to come, the substance of them being found in Christ. These feasts were prophetic types or symbols that pointed to Jesus Christ and which would be fulfilled in him. The first four were fulfilled with the first coming of Christ. The last three will be fulfilled with the second coming of Christ. The first three feasts, the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, take place in the spring over a period of eight days. The fourth feast, the Feast of Harvest, also known by its Greek name Pentecost, a word meaning 50. Again, pent is five, the pentagram or the pentagon, or we call the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. Uh, is 50 days later at the beginning of the summer. The last three feasts, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles took place over a period of 21 days in the fall of the year. It's been said that a picture is worth a thousand words. The Israelites were given the feasts as visual pictures, as signs pointing to the final destination. Once Jesus arrived the first time to his destination here on earth, the sign wasn't needed any longer. In other words, if I'm on the other side of the island and I see a sign that says Kailua, 14 miles, okay, that sign points me in the right direction to reach my final destination. Now, once I get to Kailua or I get to Kaneohe, I don't need that sign anymore. It has served its purpose. Its only purpose was to point me to that final destination. And so too is it with the person of Jesus Christ, his first destination, his first coming when he came here to earth. The signs and symbols had served their purpose in telling them what was coming, namely the person of Jesus Christ, their Messiah and Savior. Though the signs are of no use to us, it doesn't mean that they are of no value in what they mean to us, specifically the last three, which have profound significance, especially because the next one to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets. Any guess which one the Feast of Trumpets might be a fulfillment of? Oh, the rapture. Just thought I'd mention that in passing. But I just want to look at the first four feasts today. The first one, of course, being the feast of the Passover. This was a picture of, this was a sign pointing to the crucifixion of the Christ. We know to be true, the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church said, for Christ in Chapter 5, verse 7, the second part. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. See, we're going to get there in Exodus, for those of you who are a part of our Thursday night Bible study, but the Israelites in their exodus from the slavery in Egypt were told to take a lamb. 
And they were to inspect that lamb for four days to make sure that it was without spot or wrinkle. Then they were to take and slay that lamb. And they were to take the blood from that lamb. They were to dip a hyssop branch in it. And they were to put that blood of that lamb on their doorposts so that when the angel of death came, it would pass over them. Did you know, and I I never knew this until uh, a number of years ago, I always assumed that when they put the blood on the four posts, it was the four corners of the door. That's not true. They were to put the blood at the top. They had a basin in the middle. And they also were to put it on the side and on the side in the shape of a cross. This is how many generations before the Roman cross that they would crucify your Lord and my Lord on. This is what the Feast of Passover was to picture, was to point to, was to celebrate, was to commemorate. It's interesting because if you look at the timing of when they were to slay the lamb, it corresponds to the exact time that Jesus, our Passover lamb who was slain, was crucified from the beginning of the 10th of Aviv, the four days, the procession of the lamb into the temple at the Passover feast, Jesus' procession into Jerusalem, Matthew 21, 17. The lamb was examined for four days in Exodus 12, 1 through 11. Jesus is questioned and examined, found to be without spot, without sin, without wrinkle, without blemish for four days, Matthew 22, 15 through 33. The Passover begins on the 14th of Aviv, four days later, 6 o'clock p.m. Very precise, very specific, very exact. And this is exactly when Jesus begins his path to the cross. The third hour, 9 o'clock a.m., The lambs are prepared for the sacrifice. Jesus is beaten and prepared for the cross, Matthew 27, 28. At the ninth hour, which is 3 o'clock p.m., that's when the lamb was to be sacrificed and his blood shed. And that's the exact hour that Jesus was crucified on the cross as the fulfillment of that Passover lamb. So when God commanded Moses to give these feasts to the Israelites. What he was saying was, Moses, I want you to celebrate this because it's going to point to the Savior of the world who will come and redeem mankind with his shed blood, for there will be no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. The next feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is a picture of, a symbol of, a type of Christ's burial. Interesting, they would have three pieces of unleavened bread. What's unleavened bread? Unleavened bread doesn't have any yeast, any leaven. Uh, Yeast, leaven in the scriptures is a type of sin. Jesus is our bread of life. He is without sin. He is without leaven. God wanted the Israelites to make unleavened bread to celebrate this Passover feast because it would point to his body, his unleavened bread, which we commemorate when we celebrate the communion, which is the Passover. When we partake on the first Sunday of each month, that cup, that that piece of bread that is commemorating the Passover supper. The bread is his body. You know what's interesting The Israelites, when they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread today, how significant it is in its picture and how it points to Jesus. First, at the Passover meal, they have three pieces of bread, unleavened, symbolizing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the matzah bread in the center, the second piece of bread picturing the second person of the Trinity, Jesus the Christ, is broken in two as Jesus' body was broken too. The matzah bread now is two pieces of one bread, 
a symbol of, in typology, the nature of Jesus being dual, divinity and humanity, fully God and fully man. One piece of bread that's been broken into two, his dual nature. The larger of the two pieces of bread is called the afikamen. Afikamen is a Greek word that could mean, some Bible commentators believe, I came, just as Jesus came into the world. The afikamen, this is how they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread today in Israel. The afikamen is wrapped in an excellent cloth and hidden just as Jesus' body was wrapped in a burial cloth and hid in the tomb. And then what's interesting is the children race to find the afikamen and receive a prize, just as we come to Jesus as a child, run the race, and receive the prize. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a picture of, in typology, the burial of Jesus Christ. Now the third one, the Feast of First Fruits is a picture of the resurrection on the first day of the week. Uh, it was a celebration that took place on one day, and they would have this barley harvest, and they would do what they call a wave offering. The priest would offer this wave offering of the first fruits from the ground that would come up from the ground as Jesus came up from the ground from the tomb and rose again. And they would offer this wave offering. Now, You know what the wave offering was? It wasn't one of these. Sorry. (laughs) It was up, down, north, south, east, west, in the shape of a cross. It would point to the resurrection on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians Again, the Apostle Paul, chapter 15, verses 20 through 23, describes Christ as the first fruits. He says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, speaking of a bodily, uh, uh, their body in, in the grave. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. So again, it points to the first three feasts, the the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ in the Passover, the unleavened bread, and the first fruits uh, festivals and feasts. Now the fourth one, the birth of the church. It's called the feast of either the wheat harvest or Pentecost. Now, here's what's interesting. Uh, It was to be celebrated 50 days after, uh, and this was to commemorate Egypt leaving, uh, the Israelites leaving Egypt, and 50 days later, they arrive at Mount Sinai. And what happened at Mount Sinai? The law came down, and 3,000 people died. Now, this would also be a commemoration of, a celebration of, that would point to the birth of the church age. Fifty days later, they would tarry in the upper room. Uh, The Feast of Pentecost, we just studied it in Acts chapter 2. I realize that was about a year ago, but we did study that in Acts chapter 2. Now, the law didn't come down. The Holy Spirit came down upon them. 3,000 people didn't die. 3,000 people got saved. See, when the law came down in Exodus 32, 28, and that day about 3,000 of the people died, and then Acts 2, verses 40 and 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Again, the church was born. That's what the Feast of Pentecost was to celebrate, was the church age, where the Lord would begin to add to the church as many as should be saved. Romans 8, verses 1 through 2, the Apostle Paul to the Roman church said, 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, the law is death, but the spirit is life. The law came down on Mount Sinai and 3,000 met their death. The Spirit came down in Pentecost in the upper room and 3,000 people came to new life in Christ. So there's the four feasts, the first four that have been fulfilled. And again, Lord willing, we'll be able to uh, look at the last uh, three uh, next uh, Sunday.